Blessed are you, Jehovah our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haralem, asher kishanu, b'mitzvotah, vetzivanu, la'asak vintre, Torah. <clears throat> Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's word sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Are you ready for some medicine? And here we go. We who live in the shelter of Elyon spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai. Who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions. And under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night, the arrow that flies by day, or the plague that roams in the dark, or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open, and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent. For we will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. And they will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone. We will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents. We will trample underfoot. Jehovah says, because he loves me. I will rescue him because he knows my name. I will protect him. <clears throat> he will call on me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him when he is in trouble. And I will extricate him and bring him honor, and I will satisfy him with long life. Show him my salvation. Someone say amen. You may be seated. Let me get my glasses on. Please. Do. Arm yourself. Turn to someone and say, arm yourself. Turn to someone else and say, arm yourself. Now, I know immediately when we think about arming ourselves, we get really excited because we think, you know, what kind of gun maybe you might have or what's going on with you. But <clears throat> arming yourself in a spiritual way, we're talking about these last days. How many know we're living in the last day? Well, I don't think we're living in the last day. I don't think we're living in the last hours. I don't think we have a days to go. And so the, it's very important that we understand that if we're living in the last hour, as opposed to the last day, that we are increasingly needing to prepare ourselves for what is ready to occur. Now, I, I'm not just saying, oh, hurry up because there's going to be persecution, tribulation. There's a lot of things that can happen beyond that. Before that, that we still need to arm ourselves because we are still so sensitive as believers that some of the smallest things derail us. Still so sensitive that someone's speech or someone's words can crush us. And if we are still there, then we need to arm ourselves, get to a place where we start to uh, change some of the things and attitudes that we have. So if we're going to follow the master, and how many want to follow the master? Now be careful, hold on. I didn't say that you know him. I didn't say that you didn't love him. I said, how many want to follow him? That's a whole different realm. <clears throat> how many want to follow the master? Now you can raise your hand if you want to. Then we have to settle one main issue. And this is the main issue that we're going to be talking about tonight. And it's going to continue on next Wednesday. And that is those who obey Elohim will suffer in this life. That's the bottom line. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, in the Amplified Version, it says, Therefore, since Messiah suffered in the flesh and died for us, arm yourselves. Like what? Like warriors. With the same purpose, being willing to suffer for doing what is right and pleasing God. Because whoever has suffered in the flesh, being like-minded with Messiah, is done with intentional sin, having stopped pleasing the world. Excuse me, so that he can no longer spend the rest of his natural life living for human appetites and desires, but lives for the will and purpose of God. Definition, arm yourself. 
Definition is our sights have to change from earthly, worldly to spiritual kingdom. Means that we have to change our priorities. It means that we have to change our thinking. That means that we have to change our desires. So no one to arm yourself doesn't mean that you go to your little promise box and you pull it out and you read it and you say, wow, I've armed myself tonight. That is not enough. It doesn't mean that you quote the scripture daily. A lot of people can quote scripture. And you know, even unsaved people can quote scripture. Even the devil knows more scripture than we do. And I don't care how many things you have mounted on your refrigerator. After a while, you just ignore them anyway, correct? And so no one is trying to claim its benefits each time that you see those things. Yet it holds one of the greatest promises. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it gives us one of the greatest promises of the Brit Kadashah, and it assures us that those who suffer as Yeshua suffered will cease from sin. To arm ourselves must mean then that we are living in a day and age where we can no longer live like we want, act like we want, no longer participate in the culture and society. We've already went through Purim. We're going to go through the cleansing of Passover and, and, and go through all the fall feasts and the fall feasts ended up in Hanukkah. It's really all about making sure that we have following Yeshua HaMashiach, that we have given him our lives totally and completely, that we've decided that our way of living is not working. And that we have to start living the way he wants us to live. And that means we have to arm ourselves with the word of God. And it means that we have to do it like warriors. We have to realize that we're going to suffer it like he did. And look what he says. Died for us. That means it's a fleshly <coughs> suffering. Not just a spiritual suffering. Okay. A, a physical suffering with the same purpose. We have to have the same purpose. What? I'm willing to suffer <coughs> for the will of God. Now. Again, that is a hard thing to swallow because the will of God is, as we grow, is so different than our will. And we are so struggling to fight and live and cause our will to live. We, it's really hard to give it up. I said on Saturday, the one bad thing about a living sacrifice is that the living sacrifice wants to crawl off the altar. And we all know, no matter how many times we say, Lord, I surrender all. When we get to the place where it really truly is a surrendering of something that we don't want to surrender, that's when the struggle happens. You might not be addicted to alcohol. So you say, I give it up. Well, that's good that you can give it up because you, you're not addicted to it, right? It's an easy peasy thing. But there are things that God is requiring us <clears throat> to yield to, and it will cause us to suffer for the cause of Christ. So they will come, this purpose of arming ourselves, is that we will come to a complete spiritual maturity. And that spiritual maturity, we certainly know, does not come overnight. How many, as mature as you are, more mature now than you were when you were 2 or 12 or 16, how many know that there are moments in your life when you are challenged and you realize you're not as mature as you think you are? You might say to people or even other, I'm grown up, I, I, you know, I'm grown up. I, but yet there's a moment when you collapse in that, in that adulthood and you become just like a child again. Okay? So just as we grow uh, and grow up physically and mentally, a believer also matures spiritually. And so 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, and we're going to be looking at a lot of verses tonight. It says, therefore... And when he says, therefore, what's he want you to do? Find out what it's there for and pay attention. Therefore, do what? Rid yourselves of all malice, of all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and of all the ways there are of speaking against people. And be like newborn babies, thirsty for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up into, I like that word, what is it? Deliverance. What does deliverance mean? If you have to be delivered, that means you must have something to be delivered from. Right? No one delivers you from joy. No one delivers you from love. I mean, it seems like sometimes situations take that from you. <laughs> they took it from you. But you, you, to be delivered, the mere understanding of being delivered means you have 
you have items in your life that need to be eradicated from your life. There are things in your life that need to be set aside. And the only way that happens is through a deliverance. But the arming yourselves means it's not a spiritual deliverance, which means you have malice. I can pray for you all day long and command that malice to leave you. But there's going to be a moment. You might, you might have empowerment. You might even feel the, <clears throat> the Holy Ghost on you. But I guarantee you that malice will not leave until you exercise it out of your life. And so we begin as babies and ideally progress from infancy to childhood, then to adolescence, and then to adulthood, and then finally to maturity. And if we, anyone here says, I am fully mature, then you, you're about ready to pass away. You're not long, right? You're not long for this world because, because uh, when you've arrived to the place of complete and total maturity, then there's no need for you here. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 says, We will then no longer be infants, what? Tossed about by the waves, blown along by every wind of teaching, at the mercy of people, clever in devising ways to deceive. And Hebrews 5, 14 says, But solid food is for the what? Mature, for those facilities or faculties have been trained by continuous exercise to distinguish good from evil. Now, what is the one word we hate there in this verse? No. Exercise. We want a pill. We want someone to come in and move my arm for me. Thank you. I feel, I feel strength now. Glory to God. Exercise means you have to make a determination that you need to do something about something, and you have to exercise it physically, <clears throat> spiritually, mentally. If you're going to, if you're going to um, uh, renew your mind, that requires exercise, doesn't it? It requires you taking something out and then placing something in. Or putting something in to chase that which is not right out. Either way, you want to look at it. Something has to go out and something has to come in. Correct? And that's exercise. And we don't like exercise. I don't care who says they do. They don't. We, there, there's a moment. I mean, you might, you might have some endorphins that really get you there. But at the same time, if you could be fit and strong without it. So we have a couple things. We have to physically grow. And everyone sitting here understands that physical growth is a process with the passage of time. It's a process with the passage of time, which means you continually to grow. You can't stop it. You will never find a two-year-old who is six feet tall. With the passing of time, they continue to grow. You cannot hurry physical maturity because it's a function of time. Everyone matures differently. They grow differently. They have growth spurts differently. You can kind of figure out around what time it might be just because of science, but everyone grows differently. I have two sons. One was just an average. One was short, and I knew that one that was short was going to stay short because the grandfather on the mother's is very short, and I said, Lord, help the boy. He's going to be short, and the one who was short for a very long time grew up like 17, 18, over six foot. <clears throat> so it's a passage of time. No one can determine it. You, you, you can't take anything to hurry it up. You naturally grow at a predetermined rate that is tied to the passage of time. It's in your DNA, right? God's already ordained it. You can pray all day long. If you're, uh, you know, f- five foot 11 and you want to be six foot five, you come to the altar and pray. God, God I don't care. If, you, if your growing spurt is done, God's not interested in making you 6'5". It's the process of time. Intellectual growth is not a function of time, but of learning. Which means if you are 30 and have yet to master the first grade level of reading, you will not be able to comprehend the 10th grade level because you have not continued with intellectual growth, no matter how much physical growth you have. Conversely, there are 12-year-olds who have completed their high school education because they have increased their learning, therefore their intelligence has grown, and therefore they have surpassed their actually uh, physical growth, and they're smarter than what their physical growth says that they can be. And then we have spiritual growth. So we have physical growth, that is a progression with time. We have intellectual growth, which is not a function of time but of learning. And then we have spiritual growth, which is not a function of time or learning. People who have been born again for years 
are still immature babies or children in the spirit. When someone says, oh, I've been born, I know more than you, I've been born again 30 years. But storm off and slam a door. They're not mature. Shuts down, folds their hands, won't talk, not mature. I don't care how long you've been born again. This includes people that are well-versed in Scripture and great memorization. That does not bring you forth in a spiritual growth. Their knowledge of the Word does not mean that they are skilled in its application. If spiritual growth was a function of learning Scripture, then the Pharisees would have been the most mature of Yeshua's day for the simple reason they were taught at a very early age to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Has anyone ever memorized the first five books of the Bible that you could stand right now and go from Genesis to the end of the, of the Torah and not miss a beat? Well, the youngest Pharisee could do that. But they couldn't recognize the Son of God. They had memorized the whole Torah, but yet not recognized who Yeshua is. And yet Yeshua is in Genesis. He is in Exodus. He is in, come on, Leviticus. He is in Numbers. He is in Deuteronomy. So the question is, and what we're going to answer tonight and then continue on next week is, what causes spiritual growth? And I have it up there, so you don't even have to pretend that you know it. What causes spiritual growth? The function of suffering. If physical growth is a progression of time, if intellectual growth is not a function of time but of learning, and spiritual growth is not a function of learning or growth, then that means it is the function of suffering. Which is probably why Paul says, count it all joy when you fall into this suffering because God is bringing you to a place of growth. I know many who have suffered greatly, yet they remain in the trenches of bitterness and despair. And these are not the spiritually mature. So when we're going through things in our lives, we have to be careful that we look at it in a way that will propel us to growth instead of propelling us to a, in a decrease of, of our maturity. Suffering in itself does not cause spiritual growth. So I just want you to understand that. <clears throat> suffering in itself does not cause spiritual growth. Maturity is found through our obedience to follow in the midst of suffering. Take it for a moment. Because we all go through something. But the one who's willing to follow Elohim no matter what through it exhibits much growth. And this is what it means to suffer as Yeshua suffered. Remember Yeshua in the garden. Um, and I know he suffered more than just the garden and this uh, crucifixion. He suffered rejection. He suffered ridicule. I mean, there's things that he suffered that, that we suffer on a daily basis. Maybe none of us would be crucified. Maybe none of us would be martyred. But everything that you've ever suffered and for the sake of Yeshua, maybe friends have walked away, maybe family has turned their back on you, he's experienced it. He's experienced it, okay? So he knows what you're going through. But yet, that did not deter him <clears throat> from being obedient to the Father. No matter who rejected him and whatever he felt in that suffering, uh, he did not stop following his Father. No matter what the Pharisees, the religious people said about him, he did not stop following. No matter how many disciples followed him and then rejected him. He did not stop following the follow. Whatever he was suffering, he continued to follow through in obedience, and that caused him to be mature. And this is what it means to suffer as Yeshua suffered. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Even though he was the son, now finish it, he learned obedience through his sufferings. If he had to wrap himself in humanity and he had to set his Godhead aside, that means he had to learn like we learned. It doesn't do us any good if he sets his Godhood uh, aside and yet still has an inside track. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> an inside track that he still has this mm, oomph that can overcome things. He, he said, I felt what you felt. I've been through what you've been through. I felt every infirmity. I felt every temptation that you have felt. And, and I'm showing you how to live it that 
it's not an absence of suffering. It's the presence of suffering and the walking and obedience through it that will bring you to a place of maturity. All your memorization won't do it. All your coming and listening and sitting down and <clears throat> studying won't do it. It's the suffering. It's the function of suffering that brings you to a place of maturity. And we know that because the suffering uh, that, are, that challenges our life most of the time derails us, which then shows our immaturity. So the suffering that Yeshua experienced was the direct result of his obedience to the will of the Father. So that's the catch, isn't it? I follow the Father, and I get suffering. And when suffering comes, I follow the Father, and I get mature. So you can't have maturity without suffering. So the whole church now that wants people never to suffer, that you're not supposed to suffer, that you're supposed to rail against suffering, that you know it's a, a lack of your faith, it's a an attack of the enemy, and we're rebuking this and rebuking that, and we're coming against it. We're fighting against walking through the suffering. And yet, that's why we have a whole church full of immature people. Because we want what we want when we want it. And the course or the flow of this world system directly opposes the kingdom of Elohim. You have chosen to, to attach yourself to a kingdom <clears throat> that opposes this world. You should have went to another religion that doesn't oppose this world. You should have went to a club or, or some group that doesn't oppose this world. Then you could have lived in that world, done what you wanted to do, never had opposition, never, never flow against the current, and you would have been fine. But you are in a kingdom that is strikingly different and opposes this kingdom. It is completely so opposite that when you attach yourself to the kingdom of God, it can't help if you're obedient to the kingdom to cause suffering in your life. Which is why fathers and mothers will come against you. Brothers and sisters will turn against you. <clears throat> take you to the kings. Take you to the judges. They will even cause you to have, uh, be put to death. Why? Suffering. Suffering. The, the disciples suffered like Yeshua suffered. Why did Yeshua suffer? Yes, I know he suffered so that we could be saved. But he was placed in a society where his belief and following the Father in obedience would bring him to a place of suffering. Well, what, what day are you living in? The last day or the last hour, which means maybe you should have been born 100 years ago. Maybe you should have been born 200 years ago. Maybe in that moment where it's not going to be such an anti-spirit, anti-Messiah, the, the end of the age where the society is turning on you, you know, 40 years ago, whether you were born again or not, everyone pretty well basically had some good morals. I mean, you weren't really challenged by people who wanted to do right. Most people went to church. Whether they followed him or not, they, it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, 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 a thing that people, oh, you go there. You, they, they, no one cared. But today, in the kingdom that you're living in, in the kingdom that you've chosen to follow, which means the whole word of God, you start seeing the challenges not only in the outside, but in the, in the system of this religious order that is going to cause you to suffer. And Yeshua already said it. So therefore, when we obey Elohim, we move against the current. This automatically introduces conflict. Automatically. Automatically. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which gives birth to persecution, affliction, and tribulation automatically producing conflict, which puts you in persecution, affliction, and tribulation, which is why we see what we see, even if you go through a, a place where they are uh, protesting something and you're different and you have a shirt on that says differently, they won't, they won't just look at you. They will attack you. And you can say, well, then I, you need to be careful where you wear your T-shirt. Well, that would be like saying to Yeshua, you need to be careful who you talk to. Only talk to those who can't harm you. Only, only talk to those who are, not, who are not going to speak against you. And you know that we're living in a day and age where that's going to be almost totally and completely impossible. So obedience in the midst of this conflict causes spiritual growth. So if I would have started with this uh, teaching and said, how many want to spiritually grow into maturity? We all would have lifted our hands, and I would say, well, then good. Here's some suffering, and I'm going to give it to you, and this is what I want you to do. 
I want you to go to this place, and I want you to go um, to this place and speak the gospel. I want you to go preach here. I want you to go in the midst of the lion's den. I want you to go into the fiery furnace. And most of us will say, well, I really need to pray about those things. I want to see whether God really wants me to go there. But I already told you that God wants you to go there because he said, as I suffered, so will you suffer. And then he tell the disciples to go into all the world, correct? And so they went. So when we look at this in, again in 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, I'll read it again. Therefore, since the Messiah suffered physically and in the spiritual age that we're living in now, except for, except for very few, I think the, minority, the majority believes it's more spiritual than it is physical. Um, yet Yeshua talks about it physical. You will suffer physically then you too are to arm yourself with the same attitude. So that means I have to anticipate that I will, in my stand, as I am obedient to the will of God, will cause conflict. And that conflict will bring persecution upon me. It will bring tribulation upon me. It will bring maybe a a suffering of my body that I don't want to, but I'm willing to because I have to arm myself for it because this is what's going to happen, and I have to have the same attitude that Yeshua said was this. I don't care if you stone me. I don't care if you kick me out. I don't care if you reject me. I still must speak the truth, and the truth is what's going to set you free. Is that the same attitude we have? Or are we kind of looking in a way that we can get around it so we can just be calm and a little bit not so abrasive. And I'm not talking about being abrasive to be abrasive because you can speak the truth enough to be abrasive. You don't have to have your personality in there being abrasive too. Because you want truth to be abrasive, not your personality. Your personality turns people off. The, your abrasiveness of the word of God digs and plants a seed that even though it looks like it ticks them off, they will go away and think about it. If you mix your attitude in it, they will go away and think nothing about that, but they will think about your attitude. So for whoever has suffered physically is finished with sin, which tells you what does God want from you? Does he not want all of your sins to be removed? Does he want you to walk in maturity of holiness? So what does he use to get rid of your sin? Suffering. I thought maybe I heard amen back there, maybe one over there. I'm not quite sure. Maybe, Maybe it was just an angel saying, I don't know. With the result that he lives the rest of his earthly life no longer controlled by human desires but by God's will. To me, this means this. That the more I'm obedient, then the more I'm pushed into a conflict. When I'm pushed into a conflict, there is contention, there is persecution, there's tribulation. Which causes me then to push myself through it to be obedient, which causes me to mature. And then it happens again because I'm continually being mature. And that means every moment that I go through a suffering, I'm being more mature. That, to me, sounds like a God's design. Not an enemy, but a God's design. See, I think a lot of times we think that the enemy is trying to attack us to get us off track. <clears throat> but he's pretty smart, and he kind of pretty well knows that if we love God and we get attacked, we probably will go to God. So he tries to make our lives pretty even, okay, and yet God keeps on pushing us into conflict. Joseph in a pit. Come on. Daniel in a lion's den. Three Hebrew boys. I mean, Why do you open your window to pray? He didn't do it just to do it. He did it because that's what he did. He didn't stop what he did because someone said not to do it. And because he was obedient to God, that caused conflict. When it caused conflict, it caused persecution. And that persecution got him into a lion's den. But however, he continued to serve God, and God then brings him out, which that moment matures you. If you go into a lion's den, you better start getting mature. Obedience in the midst of this conflict causes spiritual growth. Let me just ask you this again. How many want to spiritually grow? We sing that song, be careful little hands, or careful little mouth what you say. So suffering after the pattern of Yeshua brings a believer to maturity. And we have read in the 
Torah, the prophets, <clears throat> the writings, the, the gospels, the epistles, um, that he wants to bring us to a place of maturity. No more as babies tossed to and fro. Well, that would mean then not only with doctrines, but it means that when conflict comes, as a baby, I'm tossed to and fro. I get upset. I do this. I, I run away from the conflict. I don't want the conflict. I, I try to hide myself from the conflict. I try to appease the conflict by stepping back a little bit. But that's not really what God is talking about, is it? So this kind of suffering is caused when we resist the will of man to submit to the will of Adonai. When you wanted to do something, I'll make it kind of superficial, but when you wanted to do something and then you come to the realization you can't do it, maybe you have another engagement, but you really want to do this, but you have another engagement, um, and you decide, well, I just better do this engagement that I've already said, you start to suffer inside. You, you, I mean, you really want, I really want there. I want to go there. And the, and the whole time you're there at the engagement that you've been in, supposed to go, your whole countenance is off. Your whole inner being is out. Because where do you want to be? <coughs> Over there. So there is a, a, a conflict, a, a, a suffering that you go through. All right? So it's not the religious suffering of self-induced pain and neglect. It's not dying of disease or lacking the finances to pay your bills. That's not the suffering that Yeshua is talking about. Because guess what? Sometimes we have and sometimes we don't. Isn't that what Paul said? When I have a lot, I praise the Lord. When I don't have a lot, I still praise the Lord. Guess what? Sometimes I have it and sometimes I don't. And there are moments when you say, oh, everything is good financially. And then the next day it's like, oh, what happened to my finances? <laughs> and it's usually when you take note that, oh, my finances are going real well. And, and you should have known not to say anything. You should just get your eyes off them. Say, I can't even look at them. Because I know something's coming. In the, in the days of the, I'm sure they still do it in monks. They, we used to go up and they would fast, but they also would beat themselves because they, they felt the, the more pain they could bring to themselves, the more glory God would get. Well, we, we do the same thing. <laughs> we think, oh, if I religiously suffer... Uh, if I induce this pain or neglect, okay, I'm going to fast for 10 days. Uh, okay, but if you're running away from conflict and you're trying to uh, just induce pain, I'm not saying fasting is good, fasting you're supposed to, I get it. But if you're just doing it to self-induce something, to bring yourself more holy, to, to bring yourself to a spiritual growth, that's not going to do it because the function uh, of spiritual growth is suffering, not self-induced suffering, but going through something that you continue to go through even though it's painful for you. So, Yehoah receives no glory from these things. <clears throat> you might receive something from it. Oh, I, I did this, I did that, I suffered for the Lord, hallelujah. You might receive some glory, but how many know that what you receive does not mean anything when it gets to heaven? So this mentality has actually caused many to search for an opportunity to inflict themselves with suffering in order to feel worthy. And the believing that Elohim is pleased if they make themselves suffer for him, which, you know, in the olden days in, in, the, um, uh, in the church, you know, the, you, uh, the more poor you were, the, the more spiritual you were. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, they, they wore it as a, like a banner. Look, I'm suffering. I don't have this. I don't have that. You know, do you, do you have a TV? Oh, no, I don't have a TV. Oh. They carry it like I'm suffering for the Lord. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I might want one, but I won't get one because, well, that's just, you know, you pleasing you, and God's not really getting anything for that. This perverts their relationship. It's causing it to be based on works and not grace. And if you follow God in obedience, you're going to have enough conflict anyway. You don't have to make up your own. So we are to embrace the suffering that Yeshua experienced. I know we look at it and we say, what, what, what a loving God that would do that. But God is looking down at us and saying, and I'm expecting you to do the same. 
Yeshua did not suffer because he was diseased. He didn't suffer because he lacked money to pay his bills or his taxes. Remember, if he needed to pay taxes, what did he do? He sent Peter fishing. So maybe the next time you say, I don't have any money, I might say, well, go fishing. <laughs> and you might say, well, I got to go fishing. Don't you have 20 to lend me? No, go fishing. Maybe if you went fishing, you might have some money. <clears throat> maybe a gold piece would be in the fish. Hallelujah. Gold's pretty good, isn't it? So this suffering he experienced was to be tempted in every manner possible and yet remain obedient to his father. When we live in the last day, read the book of Revelation, read the tribulation. The tribulation, though we want to get out, though most people or a lot of people are pre-trib because they don't want to go through suffering, but can you imagine how many spiritually immature, if there was a pre-trib that God would bring into heaven? Do you understand that he would bring people in who didn't want to experience anything? And he doesn't. He's coming after a bride without what? Spot and without wrinkle who is fully mature. And that means suffering. So really tribulation, though we, we look at it as an act of <clears throat> the enemy's raging, could be an act of God maturing his bride before he returns. Hebrews chapter 4.15 says this. Um, did I read that? Did I pass it? I don't even know what happened to my notes. <clears throat> oh, I see where it is. For we do not have a Cohen, Kadol, unable to empathize with our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted, just as we are, the only difference being that he did not sin. That's the only difference. What does it mean he did not sin? It means that he did not stop the conflict. <clears throat> it means that he went through it in obedience. It means he didn't run away from it so that it wouldn't have its work in it. He, he did the work. He went through it, and it was brought to him as conflict. He went through the conflict because he's obedient. He was obedient, which caused the conflict. Once he goes through that conflict, he does it still because it's obedient. No matter how it makes him feel, no matter what it entails him to experience, he walks through it. It's, that, it's, the, um, it's the job, and you're in the coffee room, and they're talking about something that is contrary to the Word of God, and you're there. And your silence could mean that you agree with everything that's being said, <clears throat> and you choose to be silent for the sake of not causing conflict, but yet we fail to realize that God put you there at that particular moment where, where falsehood is being spoken, that maybe you would be the one that would speak truth, but you chose an easy way out, silence, and that means then that you have not passed the test. You withdrew. Therefore, you created no conflict because you know that once you said, but here's what I believe the Bible says, that there is going to be conflict. Someone would not like you. Someone might scream at you. Someone might call you this or that. And, they would be, and, and you decided in reviewing what would happen because you, you do that in your brain, right? Okay, if I say this right now, then this, I know that sister over there is a big mouth, and I know that this one is not afraid to hit me. And you make a choice. <clears throat> well, you bypass the conflict. Now, what does that mean? That means you're still going to have to have a conflict because God does not say, oh, okay, I'll give you a pass. What does he do? There's going to be another one. You just go back around the mountain, Right? And you go through it again, and you keep going until you, until you learn it, until you become spiritually mature, that finally you are not afraid of what they think. You are not afraid of what they will say, because the only one that you are afraid of is the kingdom of God and the Father on the throne. And that's the only one you have to answer to. You may yell at me. You can spit on me. You can try to strike me. You can try to get me fired, but that will not stop me from speaking the truth in love, because I am going to... Because I'm obedient to God, created this conflict. I'm now going to walk through this conflict in obedience, and I'm going to kind of enjoy the suffering 
because it's going to cause me to have spiritual growth, which means the next time you're in a situation where that same thing happens, if you truly have spiritually mature, you will begin to realize that this won't bother you anymore. And you'll become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. But if you don't, you become weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So he suffered, but yet still remained obedient. We face resistance when our desire and the desire of those who influence us will go one direction, but Jehovah's will goes another. Goes another. And most of us have a lot of people in our lives whose direction is opposite of ours. <clears throat> even in, now remember, even in your religious circles. Because where did most of Yeshua's conflict come from? Religious people. Right? Religious people. Not the world. In fact, most of the world was coming to him. Most of the world were coming to run to him, <clears throat> to be healed by him, to be delivered by him, to, to be saved by him. Right? The religious world was in conflict with him, and he was in conflict with them. So I want you to look at this confrontation with the master. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 16, Yeshua and his disciples had come into the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi. He questioned them as to who they thought he was. You all know the story, right? And because we talk about the gates of hell should not prevail. And Peter boldly declared, Yeshua the Messiah, the son of the living Yah. That's who you are. And Yeshua affirmed Peter's revelation. Peter, that was good, but you didn't know it on your own. The Father must have given you the wisdom of it because uh, what he was saying is you're too dumb as a doornail to realize who I am, but you must have been revelation. <clears throat> and immediately following this, Yeshua told them he was going to Jerusalem. He told them that he would suffer many things and that he would be killed and then rise again. Now let's look at the story. Then he warned the Talmudim not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So this is really the first time he confirmed, I am the Messiah. From that time on, Yeshua began making it clear to his Talmudim that he had to go to Jerusalem, endure much suffering at the hands of the elders, the head Kohadim, and the Torah teachers. Hello? Can I say this again? Who did he have to endure much suffering with? Elders, <clears throat> head Kohadim, and Torah teachers. And that he had to be put to death. But that on the third day, he had to be raised to life. And only in Peter fashion did Peter took him to the side and began rebuking him. Now, again, who are you? Peter says, you are Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of the living God. He then tells him, yes, you are correct. I am the Messiah. And then <clears throat> says, this is what I'm going to do. And then Peter has the nerve to rebuke who he just said was the son of God. Come on, that takes some, some boldness, if you want to say it that way. And he took him aside, and he began rebuking him. And here's what he said. Heaven, what? Be merciful, Lord. By no means <clears throat> will this happen to you. Okay, Peter, who are you? I think I picked you up along the, the sea or your little fishing. You had a little odor of fish. That's all you were, right? But Yeshua turned his back on Kepha. Now, he's pulled aside. <clears throat> he's face to face. You don't think Peter's looking away. Peter is in his face. We know Peter. He's in his face. Heaven have mercy, Lord. You will not die. And Yeshua says, get behind me, Satan. <clears throat> you are an obstacle in my path. Read it with me. Because your thinking is from a human perspective, not from God's perspective. You know why we struggle with what I'm saying tonight? Because we have a human perspective and that we are human and not a... God perspective. But remember, you're more than human. You are born again. The rule of Kakadesh lives within you. He has empowered you. 
He has caused you to be witnesses. He has given you the strength to be obedient, correct? <clears throat> and yet Peter, in the same mouth that just spoke, you are Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of the living God, is now rebuking him. And Yeshua has to do an illustrated sermon. He has to turn his back on Peter and signify, get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my path. Can I, can I just say this to you? Sometimes when the enemy gets on your shoulder and tells you that this is not what it should be, you should be okay and you can be quiet and you can do this, and that really is the obstacle. That really is the enemy trying to stop you from going through the conflict, which would cause persecution, so that you could grow. He doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to spiritually mature. He wants you to remain a baby that continues to run away from conflict, continues to run away from persecution, who is waiting for God just to take them away because all of hell <clears throat> it needs to come and and, and just uh, cause great pain to a lot of people, but not me. Yeshua had told his disciples that it was Elohim's will that he suffer, die, and rise again. Yet Peter and the other disciples believed it was only a matter of time before Yeshua would set up his kingdom. We are in the same place. We think it's just a matter of time that he sets up his kingdom and Yeshua is saying, I have to mature you first. And you must suffer like I have suffered for the kingdom. Acts chapter 1, 6 says, when they were together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule to Israel? This is interesting because that's all that we want. The, the whole premise of people living in the last day, even in these, these um, oh my Lord, what are they called? These things coming? The eclipse coming, all this. All we want is the rapture. The Lord's coming. Lord's coming. <clears throat> Sign, Lord's coming. Lord's coming. We're, we're still saying self-rule. He's coming back to, to set up his kingdom. We can't wait for 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 his kingdom. His kingdom's come. His kingdom come. His kingdom. Okay. I'm excited about his kingdom coming. I want his kingdom to come. But you know what he needs to do a lot? I know me and I know you. We got a lot more maturing to do. Come on. We got a whole lot more maturing to do. Because we're still afraid to voice. We're still afraid to make a stand. We're still afraid someone's going to throw something at us. We have to duck. We're going to get hit. We're going to suffer. What, what, I would, what if they kill me for no reason? Well, if they kill you, it's for no reason. There is a reason. The reason is that you stood up for the kingdom of God. And maybe it was for such a time as this that you would make a stand. And yes, it might cost you your life, but it doesn't cost you your life Completely because you have eternal life. But we still struggle against. But yet Yeshua said, you will suffer like I have suffered. And he wasn't talking spiritually. He was talking physically. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying let's all sign up and say, well, you know, how can I get suffered physically? You know, can you have a list so I can decide which one I want? All I'm saying is that you have to be willing to be obedient to the kingdom of God, even if it's con it causes conflict, and if that conflict causes persecution, tribulation, and some hardship to you, you still then walk through it in obedience because if you get in there and then get mad at God, if you get in there and get upset at God and you become bitter and angry, you have walked only halfway through, and then that, <clears throat> because of your lack of obedience, causes you to go backwards instead of forwards, which I really believe that's one of the reasons why Yeshua kept saying, Count the cost, count the cost, count the cost, count the cost. Because an army that goes to fight will have what? Losses. Come on, they will have losses. They will have losses of sons and daughters and men and women, <clears throat> of civilians and warriors. That's what war entails. So guess what? Count the cost. And he said, arm yourself like what? Warriors. And there might be a casualty <clears throat> here or there. You might experience something that you don't want to experience and be uncomfortable with something that you'd never thought you would have to experience if you would just would have kept your mouth shut. But we're not designed to keep our mouth shut. It's like fire shut up in our bones. We are designed to let the word of God out. How do I know? Because if you are mad, you don't keep quiet too much. 
So I know you can let it out. You just don't know which one to let out, right? And you say, well, I'm a very quiet person. It's those quiet people you got to watch. Because they, they let it just rest there for a moment. When you walk away from them, they're on your back. You're like, what, what, what happened? My sister is four foot <clears throat> nothing. But I wouldn't make her mad. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I tiptoe around her as much as I would possibly because she's not, Hammy, you would not even cause her to even blink an eye. She'd be wrapping herself around you on top of your head all around, and uh, she doesn't care. She'd be up on you like, she's got some boldness. She is fiery, and she has no, I hope she's not listening, but she has no filter. <laughs> she has no filter. <clears throat> she's the one above me. We kind of look alike a little bit, other than she doesn't have a beard. And the difference is, I have a filter. She does not have a filter. But if she ever got on fire for God, I'm telling you what. So why would he die now? The apostles are thinking. When the hope of the kingdom was so near. And Peter was confused. Which I understand because we get confused our own selves. I mean, what does he mean? I'm going to die. What will happen to us? What, what good could his dying possibly do? These are all things that we say to ourselves. What good is this going to do me? <clears throat> Sitting in the coffee break room and they're saying stuff. You say, what good is this going to do if I say something? Who am I? I'm not going to say anything. It's just going to cause a ruckus. How do you know that you're not there for such a time as this to cause a ruckus? Again, I'm talking wisdom, knowledge. I'm not talking jump on the couch and wave your Bible and say, oh, you're going to hell right now in a handbasket. Just want you all to know that. Burning, 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 burning. Really burning. I'm just talking about speaking the truth. Because you can just make people just as bad by speaking the truth calmly. You can just say, that's not true. Then you're looking for the... <laughs> Let me say it beside the door. That's not true. Let me say it with the door a little bit open. That's not true. Just, of course, I hear the Lord say, run. <laughs> Stephen knew who he was talking about. Stephen knew who he was talking to when he started proclaiming what he was saying. And they what? Stoned him. He just got his ministry going. He could have said, now listen, I'm new in the ministry. I need to get some things underneath my belt. I like to like to be something in God's kingdom for a little while, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to take this slow. I'm just going to love people over here, minister to people over here. No, he came out of it, full force, preaching the gospel. And when he stoned who? Like Gail says often, and I say it often, Yeshua stands. Stands to receive Stephen. So sometimes your, your, your maturity doesn't take as long as you think. <clears throat> and sometimes it takes a real long time. His fears, Peter's, focused on self-preservation instead of the will of the Father. And that's when we can try to make sure that we're doing right. Because if you are in your brain trying to preserve your life, your reputation... Your, your relationships, that is why you're not speaking truth, then that is motivated by fear. And that's not God. He had yielded to the des desires of the same selfish desire and nature that entered the man at the garden. <clears throat> it is the self-ruled will that opposes the will of Adonai. Self-ruled will. How many still and I'll raise first, have self-ruled will. If you're still saying no one can tell me what to do, that means you're still saying it to the Father. <clears throat> I just got news for you. 
I don't need to listen to you, but I'll listen to the Father. I won't listen to it. No, you're not listening to the Father. That's why he said, honor your mother and father. Honor your mother and father means you honor him. If you don't honor your mother and father, you don't honor him. You can't dishonor mother and father and honor him. You can't disobey authority unless he asks you to do things that are different from God, unless they're, uh, God's bringing you to a different direction. You can't do that and, and respect God's authority because he's given those authorities. <clears throat> Again, you can, you can speak against that authority and still have respect. You can say no and pay the consequences, right? So you don't, you're not, you know, drug off just, be, oh, I got to because it's nothing in Torah that says so. You can say no because you know what the, what the word is saying to you. you. You hear the Spirit of God speaking the truth to you, and so you're saying no. Paul said no. Peter said no, and they paid a price. But, and sometimes they paid it with whippings and beatings and jail, and sometimes they got thrown in and God got them out, and sometimes they didn't get out. They had to wait the time out. Sometimes God brought a basket to bring them down on him. To escape, sometimes they didn't. <clears throat> Just don't always look for the basket. So Yeshua seized this opportunity, and he used Peter's heir to teach the disciples this powerful truth. In Matthew 16, 24 through 28, then Yeshua said to his Talmudian, this is a powerful truth, if anyone wants to come after me, let him say no to himself. Take up his execution stake and follow me. You can't follow him and take up that which is stopping you unless you say no to you. <clears throat> for whoever wants to save his own life will what? Destroy it. But whoever destroys his life for my sake will find it. And what good will it do someone if he gains the whole world but forfeits his life? Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his conduct. Yes, I tell you that there are some people standing here who will not experience death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Interesting, isn't it? That we have to say no to ourselves and be willing to forfeit our life no matter what it is for the truth. That's all, just for the truth. Listen, people put their lives in danger for road rage. which is ridiculous. <clears throat> okay, they pulled in front of you. You're now going to pull in front of them, get out, have a fight, get a bat, get a weapon. That's stupid. That's for no reason. And lose your life for absolutely no reason. But yet for the kingdom of God, there is a reason. Because it could save someone. It could change someone. So the only way to walk with Yeshua is to completely Deny yourself <clears throat> and take up your cross. Someone say, deny yourself. Say no to yourself. Maybe that's what we should do every morning. Get up and say, hello, good morning. Thank you for that. My soul is returned to me. Now, no. No to you. Yes to God. And that means dying to your own desire and will. That's what it means. To say no to you means your desire and your will has no place within you. So this attitude enables you and I to follow Yeshua HaMashiach in his example of obedience in the face of suffering. Whether you have died to your desires or not, <clears throat> you will eventually find yourself in a position where you will have to choose between comfort, advantage, security, self-esteem, pleasure, or the will of God. So what do we need to do? We need to arm ourselves. Like what? Like a warrior. Now, I'm not a warrior. We have warriors here. And when, when you guys arm yourself, what does that mean? If, if the army said arm yourself, what does that mean? Get ready for a fight. And what, what does that entail when you arm yourself? You train. <clears throat> Make sure you're ready. I think you have to have a mindset, correct? Right equipment. You have to have a mindset. When you go in, you're going in for the long haul. You're not going in and saying, well, i got to fill things out and see what's going on. Oh, that's too much too, too much uh, uh, gun ammunition, too many fire. I, I think, I'll, no, 
No, you have to be willing to go into the fire. You have to be willing to go into the fight. You have to be willing, and it might cost you your life, and you have to have a mindset that says, that'll be okay, because I'm doing it for the cause, for my country, for whatever. Whatever they, whatever they give it to you to do, that's what you're going you have to. You have to make that. You have to say that. And here we have this kingdom <clears throat> that we serve a God who's given us everything, and if you died for an army, for government, the only thing I'm going to give you is, uh, you know, a little bit of money and, and say, thank you, and here's your flag to the family. You don't get anything else, but Yeshua gives us everything. I mean, a crown, a, an eternal home, a, a welcome procession. He, he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and he watches over you for the rest of eternity. I mean, come on. So we need to arm ourselves. And the reason why we need to arm ourselves is because I need you to know this, that Elohim does test you. He might not tempt you, but he does test you. Because the only way that you can progress from grade to grade is by testing. You don't get out of the first grade unless you test out. And if we let you pass without testing out <clears throat> in a way that is for that grade, you end up being in high school dumb as anything. And you can't do anything when you leave. And here's the thing about God. He doesn't let you go through just because he thinks you're cute or your family's cried at, your, at the door in the office. He's interested in your growth. That's, how, that's true love. He's interested in your growth. So guess what? If you didn't pass the test the first time, we're going to go around the mountain and come back again. He's not going to say, that's okay. That's okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. <clears throat> no. You can give every excuse, and he's going to say, that's nice. I understand those excuses. But let's try it again. And it means that I am willing to be obedient to God, which will cause conflict. Tomorrow morning when I wake up, I know that if I'm going to be obedient to God, there could be conflict tomorrow morning. <clears throat> Somewhere during the day, there could be a conflict. That conflict could turn into persecution, tribulation, agitation, some stuff. Physically harm me, maybe. But I also have to arm myself to know that I'm going to be obedient even if it causes conflict. And when I do get in a conflict with persecution, tribulation, or, or whatever is going to happen physically to me, I have to have enough relationship with him to continue to be obedient through it. Praise him in it. Not be bitter in it. Not be angry in it. I have to walk through it. <clears throat> which is Paul and Silas gives us an understanding. They are in the jail. They've been through it. They didn't just get in the jail. They were beat, whipped. And we're not talking about, we're talking about those days whip and beat. It hurts. Right, you're in. There you go. We'll beat you first, you know, throw you in there, put you in chains in a dungeon. There's no... There's no bars where you see other people. There's no TV, no food, maybe a little bread thrown in, maybe a little water. I mean, it is, it is concrete. It is dark. It is dungeon. It is no light, no nothing. Come on. And you're in chains. And they <clears throat> were there because they were obedient, which caused conflict, which brought them to a persecution, which brought them into jail, which brought them into beating. And they're sitting there talking to each other saying, can you believe this? I hate, I, why is God letting us do this? This is ridiculous. Where's God in all this? No, what did they do? He started to sing. Started to worship. You know why? Because they thought, this is great. That the truth that I've spoken and the will of God in my life, I'm willing to endure this for the kingdom. Because they had in mind what? Yeshua on a cross. Now remember, just to go ahead of it, this is why Peter said, hang me on a cross, but hang me upside down because I will not die like my Savior. But I'm willing to die on a cross. And then God shakes the jail and they are released. But there's some people to get saved through all that, right? Who accept Yeshua HaMashiach. 
So you never know what the purpose of the suffering is. And if you always run away, maybe the will of God for your life will not be performed and maybe someone will not be touched the way that they could be touched. Maybe someone will, that was supposed to come to know him will not come to know him because you refuse to grow up spiritually and endure what needs to be endured. Do I have an amen? All right, we'll pick up on it next week. Any questions? Yes, my sister. Okay, make a statement. Yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> You've armed yourself. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Perfect example. Perfect example. All right, let's stand before Adonai. I'm free no longer to be bound. The chains of sin are broken in my life. And I know.